Thank you so much. Um, we're going to be joined now by my colleague Jessica Kardashian, who is director of our DC office here and our <coughs> federal policy initiatives. Jessica also taught in New York City and then uh, actually worked in Congressman and Senator Bernie Ant Sanders' office before she meandered her way over to the Learning Policy Institute. So we're delighted to have Jessica who will help moderate the panel and introduce the rest of the panel. I will welcome up our panelists. Um, we will start with uh, Seguin Eubanks, if you can join us, please. He's the inaugural director of the Center for Education, Innovation, and Improvement and visiting professor at the University of Maryland College Park. Dr. Eubanks also served as, serves as the chair of the Board of Education for Prince George's County Public Schools, 132,000 student school district bordering Washington, D.C. Uh, we are also really excited to have Antonio Iglesias, who is a earth science teacher, very hard, at East Side High School in Newark, New Jersey, where he taught for the past six years, and he's a graduate of the Newark Montclair Urban Teacher Residency Program. And last, but definitely not least, is Nyla Williams, a student leader and board member with the California for Justice uh, in Oakland, California. She's currently pursuing her high school diploma, diploma through Gateway to College at Laney College and plans to become a teacher. Really excited about this. Lots of great perspectives. So uh, we will start with you, Sagoon. Um, you're currently the chair of the Board of Education at Prince George's County Public Schools. We saw the calculator for uh, Prince George's County in Desiree's presentation. <laughs> yes. Um, could you share a bit of context for uh, the information that, that Desiree shared regarding Prince George's County and the impact of teacher turnover on your district? Uh, sure. Happy to. First, uh, thank you very much uh, for having me. And, and most important, thank you for continuing to make this issue of teacher turnover uh, central to the work that we do in improving education. Um, uh, you mentioned Prince George County is 132,000 uh, student district uh, bordering D.C., one of the 17th or 18th largest in the country. Um, when I read the report, it's interesting when you look at the demographics uh, county and when you look at the indicators uh, for teacher turnover, we pretty much have the trifecta. Um, disproportionately high number of Title I schools. We have about 64% of our students who receive free and reduced lunch. Um, we, have, uh, we are a predominantly minority school district. About 60% of our students are African American. Another 30% are, are Latino Hispanic, uh, a number that has uh, about tripled over the past 15 years. Um, we uh, have, we are actually a district that has uh, a predominantly minority teaching workforce, uh, which I think is unique to a whole lot of other districts in the country. Uh, we are both proud of that fact, and at the same time, when you look at the data about turnover, uh, it indicates uh, that we have uh, some significant challenges. Uh, and so when I look at that data, your, uh, 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 our numbers are slightly different, but pretty much the same. Basically. Um, we have uh, uh, about 10,000 teachers, uh, and so the number that you have represents about a 10% annual turnover, and that is about what our data tells us, that we turn over about 10% of our teachers uh, every year. Now, 10% in one sense is like an average number when you look at what's going on, but in a district our size, it means we have to recruit over 1,000 new teachers each and every year just to keep up with the pace of our turnover rate. Uh, and so it is indeed uh, an ongoing challenge. It means that we have gotten, uh, we're also in a state in Maryland that is, uh, that is not a high producing state, so we uh, have a pretty much international recruitment system. Uh, we go all over the country and in different parts of the world to meet uh, our recruitment needs. Uh, and a district that spent, I think, uh, a lot of time early in this process getting really good at recruitment uh, and, and now have started to pay more attention to that other end of it. Um, I think that we spent a lot of time just thinking, hey, this is part of the process. What are we gonna do? We need a thousand, let's get a thousand. We need a thousand, let's get a thousand. And we got pretty good at it. Um, but, uh, but we started to need to pay significantly more attention uh, to how we keep the folks who we get. Um, my, my only other thought, when I look at that number, 25 million, uh, it is fair to say, um, if we cut retention in half, 
As a school board member, I salivate about what I might do with $12.5 million. Uh, we are currently in negotiation with our employees now. Uh, the recession hit our county hard, uh, and we have recovered at a slower rate than the rest of the region. Uh, so our, uh, our employees are pretty far behind in the salary schedule, and $12.5 million represents pretty close to about a full step in salary for our workforce. Um, when I look at things like uh, we have 209 buildings, we have some of the oldest buildings in the state of Maryland and around the country. Uh, we have a multi-million dollar maintenance backlog. What I wouldn't do with $12.5 million just to hire a second shift of maintenance so that people can fix our building. This is not to mention the new buildings we have to build. This is just to keep the ones that we have running. Um, we uh, are still, I was at a parent and community advisory council when a parent came to me last night and asked why there were 40 teachers in her middle school algebra one class uh, and what we could do to reduce class sizes. So when you look at what the impact uh, of, uh, of this number is, is pretty dramatic, and I think if we were able to do something about it, um, uh, it could make a significant difference in how we uh, can, can help students in our district. Okay, and thank you. I want to continue uh, answering that question around impact. So, Marla, you're a senior in high school uh, in the Gateway to College program. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you've experienced the effects of teacher turnover? Um, well, the public school for almost more than two years. I remember a lot of it in my freshman year. Uh, freshman year is usually, it starts off really unorganized. Mm -hmm. um, it's your first transition to high school. You're not really prepared. So the last thing you want to see is your teachers. But that was my experience. Um, I had this uh, pre-algebra teacher only lasted two weeks. Um, she was clearly she was clearly unorganized. The class was unorganized, and uh, put the students in check. She wasn't in check either. So eventually, she <laughs> she ended up slapping one of the students. And a few days after, she she resigned uh, before she got fired, I guess. But um, clearly. Uh, the reasons why she left was like she says that she she wasn't really ready. She had a lot of kids. She was tired. She didn't want to do all the reading. So um, it was clear that she just wasn't prepared to be a teacher. At the time, I wasn't in Californians for Justice, so I was kind of questioning, well, how did she become a teacher? I didn't I didn't understand the process at that time, but it was clear didn't get the proper training due to the fact that okay. Great. Yeah, if everyone can make sure the red light is on and just pull the microphones a little closer. Antonio, so you've heard Sagoon and uh, Nyla talk about it from their experience. Um, are you observing the same turnover in uh, Newark public schools? And if so, what do you think is contributing to that turnover in your district? Thanks, everybody. And thanks for having me. Um, I would say definitely, it's definitely what we're seeing in Newark. For example, so I'm entering my sixth year now. And in just my department, in the science department, we have 15 positions. And now entering my sixth year, I have seen 16 teachers leave. So pretty much every position has been lost and replaced in some capacity. And, and I think it's what was in the research, what Sagoon and what Nyla have been talking about, it's a mix of everything. Half of it is compensation. I'm from a district where, for whatever reason, the salary schedules ended up the way they were. Many teachers who are earning masters actually earn less money for the same steps as teachers who have bachelors, which is a whole other fun side story. Um, beyond that, it's a lot of, as Desiree was saying in the research, we, we all have science backgrounds especially, so we are leaving for these lucrative positions. We are seeking opportunities that cater to our needs because we've really invested in this world of science and we want, especially as I do as a teacher, I want to share that world of science with them, but uh, the reasons for us staying become less and less and also echoing this idea of administration where 
Um, and I think it's also compounded by the fact that when you have many new teachers on top of it, now that same administrator has to cater to the needs of many new teachers. And then the exhaustion of these resources where on top of it, if the administrator is not prepared, now on top of it, they're catering to many teachers who aren't prepared. And it, it just becomes this feedback loop uh, to the point where it's like, you know, defense of the dark arts and Harry Potter, and it's just every year it's a new <laughs> teacher. And so I, I think I, I'm, I'm really seeing the same exact thing. It's, it's just every year it's a new face for the, not only for the students, but for the teachers and for the administration. And, and I think the frustration of that also caters to it too, because there's, there's no, it's always in transition. It's always in flux. There's no sense of being static. So I, I, I definitely seeing a lot of the same things. So this idea around uh, teachers leaving because it's not where they are, it's not an affordable profession. I know Desiree spoke to it during her presentation. So uh, in Prince George's County, you hire um, first year teachers who often stay for a couple of years and then move to more affluent districts such as uh, counties such as Montgomery uh, and Howard counties. Can you speak to this phenomenon, why it occurs, and what you're doing to try um, and make sure that you keep those excellent teachers in your district? Sure. Uh, yeah, that is a phenomenon that we've uh, dealt with for a long time, particularly in the in the Washington D.C. You know, a lot of perception and then some uh, combined reality. Uh, and the fact is that we do have seen. I can tell you, there's a lot of movement in between counties. Uh, uh, again, just this week, I met with uh, a teacher who left for D.C. Uh, who, because the salary was higher. Um, but like the working conditions back in Prince George's County and came back for a pay cut um, uh, to come back to the county. Uh, so, so part of what our struggle is, one is clearly one of, of compensation. I mentioned, uh, I mentioned that we're significantly behind our colleagues uh, in other counties. Uh, and we battle, uh, uh, we have a relatively constant battle of perception for our county. Again, we're a county that is, uh, that uh, when you really peel back some of what we do, we're incredibly successful. So our data shows that our African American students are achieving at rates higher than African American students in any other county in the state, uh, uh, and possibly across the nation. Uh, but at the same time, overall, we're still the second lowest performing district in the state of Maryland based on most other indicators. And so we battle this constant battle of perception that Prince George's County is not the place you want to be, that if you get your stuff together and you get you come in through Prince George's County, we have a pretty big alternative route program. You get your certification, you get your credentials, and you move on to greener pastures. Uh, so we really tried to, to, to fight that perception. We've actually, um, interestingly, kind of contrary to the data, we have a, uh, a resident teacher program. Uh, and over the past several years, we've been able to reduce our, our, our actually our attrition through our resident teacher program is significantly lower uh, than, uh, than, than across the rest of uh, the district. Um, we believe that's partly because most of the teachers who we recruit in that program are local teachers, people who live in the county, uh, live, in the, live in the state of Maryland. Um, I, I, I will, I can't say this uh, without Linda being right here, put an editorial comment that um, if it's up to me as a school board chair, I would turn our resident teacher program into a true residency model is what it really needs to become so that we deal not only with doing better with retention, but we're getting folks who are better prepared uh, uh, to be effective from day one on the job and we have work to do uh, in that area. Uh, but those are kind of just a few of the ways in which we kind of continue to struggle. I will mention we've tried to be creative with that. A couple few years ago, we started a middle college program uh, in the health sciences. Uh, and, uh, and we've had our second cohort of graduates who graduate from high school and community college on the same day. It was a great program, and this September, we launched a new one specifically related to careers in teaching and education. We're very proud of our Teaching Career Academy, uh, and so we have our first cohort of 50 students who just started as freshmen uh, in our Career Academy with the idea of really building Grow Your Own programs and having gra graduates who graduate four years from now with both uh, a high school diploma and uh, uh, an associate's degree on their way to careers in teaching. So we're trying to do a lot more to kind of keep, uh, build good, grow your own programs. Great, thank you. And one of the efforts that you described was the residency program. Antonio, you're a graduate of the Newark Montclair Urban Residency Program. Can you talk a bit about how that program prepared you for teaching? Uh, and 
did it have any influence on your decision? Um, so yeah, thanks for Sagoon for hyping up residency programs before I speak. Um, I, it's it's very multifaceted. The really amazing experience that I had with my residency, and so just to really clue people into residencies, and, and Desiree sort of primed it as well as this idea of sort of like a medical residency, but with teachers instead. And so we travel as a cohort. Uh, my cohort had eight of us, um, and we were individuals who were in the schools from day one with our mentor teachers, and we took classes together, and we were a small community. And I think that's one of the cornerstones for why we felt so prepared, first of all, was just support. This idea that we knew people that we identified with, we were always placed with them, so they would try to put us in pairs or trios in schools, so that when we were placed, we had familiar faces that we could rely on as resources. But beyond that, it's really about the philosophy of the program that I was in. So it was only math science education, so first off, really trying to hit that niche market of areas that tend to not be well prepared. But on top of it, uh, well, actually just to elaborate on that, it, giving the sense of changing also the, the way you teach science. So it becomes inquiry driven, it becomes student centric. This idea, this paradigm shift of you are no longer instructing students about rote memorization, but you are trying to put the ownership with the students as well. Uh, and then on top of it, we were also trained in having social justice in our classroom. And, and, and that caters in both directions, not only for the students where you're really trying to foster democratic policies or processes in the classroom, but on top of it for why I stay, right? I stay to advocate for them. I, I was learning how to really be a social advocate on behalf of them. And, and so, you know, when they were trying to turn our school into a turnover program that would see us have longer days for a very small stipend. Uh, we felt this was not in the needs of our students and many of us within our cohort spearheaded this response to not permitting this because we're there for the students, we're there for the communities, the stakeholders that are most valuable are them. Uh, and then just to go back full circle back to how the residency further caters support is we also have induction. So this idea that once you are released into the wild of teaching, you are not abandoned. It's this idea that for three years after, I had retired teachers who would visit my classrooms periodically and make sure that I still felt supported beyond my mentor, my in-school mentor. And it comes to the point where the program becomes so sustainable that now, full circle, I'm now working with the induction program. Uh, and so this idea that it, it creates cultures in small microcosms that are meant to build. So we started in one school as a lab and, and now we really have impact for three or four high schools. So that's really the idea is that they're, they're small at first and there's a lot in the f to put up front, but the residual effects of it really addresses a lot of what this whole idea of turnover is. It's reducing that. Great, thank so. you. Um, and I think it's important to point out that you also spoke to not only providing you with the support that you need, but also to develop the skills that you had to be a more effective teacher, um, which I think efforts. Um, Nyla, you are a board member with Californians for Justice, and you work with them on relationship-centered schools. Can you tell us a little bit about that campaign, why teacher turnover is an important issue for the campaign, and what you're doing to address? So um, the relationship center school campaign is uh, more about um, making sure that students and teachers feel supported in their schools. And um, each region has a different way of targeting, targeting solutions uh, regarding this campaign. Our campaign has uh, three bucket lists. So the first one is investing in staff. The second one is creating um, spa space for relationship building. And the third one is um, implementing student voice. So currently in Oakland, we are focusing on investing in staff. And uh, one of those solutions is one, definitely better pay, <laughs> of course. And the second one is uh, really upgrading the way we train teachers, especially high quality principals. Um, we spe specifically want to upgrade our training for newer teachers so that when they come into uh, the teaching environment, their, their classroom environment, it's not you know, as disorganized. Great. So before we turn it over to the audience for questions, uh, just want to ask each of you a final question um, before the audience questions. Uh, what's one thing that you think it's important for our audience to understand regarding the impact of teacher turnover from your perspective as a school board member, a teacher, and a student? So maybe we'll start with, with Nyla. 
Oh, yeah. Um, if there's one message you want the audience to kind of understand around the impact of teacher turnover, what can be done about it, what would you like to share with them? Um, well, for an example, as an impact, um, a definite impact for uh, collegiate turnover. turnover. For me, uh, I had some good teachers in public school as well, as one of them was uh, a history teacher of mine. And she... Uh, kept the students in check. She checked on their grades. She had a positive relationship with them, and she she um, made the classroom environment very comfortable in a way where the students were able to um, learn good habits that they needed to learn in life more than just in school. Mm -hmm. So I feel like you know teachers like that um, are need to be more like more into teacher training. We need to have teachers like that into teacher training so that we can have teachers like that able to stay in the district because those are the kind of teachers that, that they stay there and they really build a positive relationship. I feel like every student, like the teacher I had, every student should have a teacher like that. So I feel like um, that really just goes into the, the way of how we train and um, how we just really support our staff. So I, I think for me from hearing just the comments and I think the big challenge when you're teachers, you're just so in the realm of teaching that you forget that there's this whole world existing outside of that. And I, I think with teacher turnover, it's just this reminder that it impacts everybody. It impacts the students who are there, obviously, that's the most direct impact, but it impacts the teachers who stay and, and keep witnessing the frustrations that both you have and the students have. It impacts the administration, it impacts the community who you want to engage, but they feel disenfranchised by this idea that you can't create a safe space because there is no sense of being static. And it impacts above, I mean, it impacts the policymakers who don't know how to solve the problem because it is so multifaceted. And I think we're, this is definitely going in the right direction, but I think it's just this reality that everybody is affected in some capacity. I think that's really my takeaway. Sure. So I think my one takeaway is there's so much that we can do, uh, I, we believe, that doesn't take resources. However, <laughs> it's really hard to think of, of, of doing this without making the investments. I think about what I could do if, I, if we cut attrition in half and save $12.5 million. Um, but I also think about the fact that I need $12.5 million to invest in order to cut attrition in half. <laughs> so, for example, we, um, we have a, a, a new teacher academy, we have an induction program, we have a really good peer assistance and review program, but fewer than half of all of our new teachers get those services because we don't have enough mentors, we don't have enough peer review coaches, um, everybody, ev everyone gets the kind of new teacher academy weekend, you know, two days before school, everyone gets that, but once they get into the classroom and they start to struggle, um, uh, those with the highest need get, get support. But the everyday teachers who are doing their best, who seem to be hanging okay, uh, tend not to get the, the, the support that they need and deserve. Uh, and so if we were, a, if we were be, to get more mentors or to, or to expand the kind of resources that we had, uh, then, then, then I, I think that, uh, that we go a long way. Uh, but it is about how we combine a different approach to being more bold about the investments that we make with uh, approaches to changing the cultures of our schools in ways that don't take money, uh, but changing culture is a pretty hard thing to do as well. For our next panel, we have time for audience questions for Sagoon, Antonio, Nyla, and for Desiree as well. Um, we have a microphone at the center. So. I thoroughly enjoy the presentation excuse me today, I find it very, very exciting. But my question is this, when we talk about teachers and we talk about students, our voices tend to be lost in, uh, in, the, in the nation. How do we build coalitions? How do we build and bring in policymakers because we cannot do this by ourselves? We already know success stories exist in other countries. You know, Linda's been doing this for decades and decades and decades and decades, <laughs> and should I say decades? 
<laughs> we know what works, but how do we build? How do we build that coalition? How do we bring the coalition and have folks up there, the parents, the community members, be alongside of you, uh, echoing the same things that you're saying? Yeah, sure. Why not? Um, so. I mean, that's really, that's the number one challenge right now is how do you get your voices heard? And, and it's just focusing on publicizing as best you can. And, and you have to start small. I mean, we have very strong ties to the councilmen in our area um, and really trying to get the sense of creating neighborhood schools again and making it a community where you start small and you have to keep advocating. I mean, that's all it really comes down to. And, and it's exhausting and tiresome. And But you have to work and finesse the networks that you have. I mean, I work very closely with Montclair State. Um, and I will forever use them as my advocates, but you have to find those people who are willing to speak up because, I mean, and it's weird because especially from Newark, New Jersey, we received that Facebook money all those many years ago and it went to nothing, um, basically. It went to administrative costs and it went, it found many ways. So I, I think it's, it's making sure that the message is heard of where the money should go to and reinforcing that, that it, it should be going to preparation, it should be going not necessarily more bottom up than top down, because I think that's our frustration, but how to get that message heard, that's been the frustration since, at least I've only been in it for seven years, day one for me, but um, that's what I've seen ever since my journey has begun. Top down. So I, I just know, and obviously we have to build these coalitions and from just from a kind of a, a local level, uh, getting student voice involved and engaged in this and getting parent voice involved and engaged in this. Actually, I probably should have mentioned this earlier. It's pretty exciting for us that we have a parent and community advisory council uh, and the parent co-chair uh, brought before our parent council that the issue that the council should focus on this year is teacher morale in order to address teacher attrition. So these parents who are active in the schools are looking around and saying, hey, we're sick of seeing long-term mm -hmm. subs for our, for our students, we're sick of seeing new, te new faces every year, and they want to be involved and engaged in being part of that solution for us. So building those local community, particularly bringing student voice and parent voice into the mix, I think is important as well. Uh, in the organization, in Californians for Justice, we, we are all about um, student voice, and we try, to make, um, we try to make sure that we have students speaking to um, a lot of decision makers, like the school board and the school district, as much as possible. Um, we we always go to uh, the school board, the district, and we call, we tell them that that it's important to have student voice in our schools. And um, our teachers really understand that. And we've had a lot of meetings with our teachers and our board members, where students are able to just say what really needs to be going down. Um, I feel like. That should be something oh, in a nationwide uh, student voice is is very important. And what our organization does is is organize those students so that they have a platform where they can just say their voice. They have the opportunity to say this is my experience and um, what's going on in my classrooms, and it gives a really good insight. Like right now, on on <laughs> what really what we really need for our schools. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Jessica. Thank you, panelists. Uh, great question. I think forums like this help keep this on the policy uh, radar and, and build that advocacy movement. So I appreciate what you're doing today. Uh, my name is Ash Vasudeva, Carnegie Foundation Advancement of Teaching. Uh, my question for you uh, is, in the report, you identified accountability as a major source of teacher dissatisfaction. Uh, can you talk about how that's playing out in your systems and whether or not you see these, th these pressures changing uh, with ESSA legislation? So I guess from what I'm gathering from the report from accountability, it has to do basically what's expected of us on the day to day. And there was that one slide where it talked about, you know, I think it was that first one that really hit hardest for me, which is this idea of this, this the one teacher who had the expanding sense of duties and responsibilities for the same pay. And I mean, hey, I was on a contract freeze for three years, so I know that more so, especially now. Um, and the reality was that every day, and it's always the science department because we're, we're always pushing ahead, but then it's like, oh, you're doing that? Let's do more. Let's do even more data. Can you collect even more data points? Can you have even more expansive 
um, lesson plans to the point where you're writing hours of lesson plans and the time it takes to write one physical lesson plan is longer than teaching the lesson. And it's just like, where is this going wrong? And I mean, I've been doing this for like seven years, so I have the opportunity to sort of rehash and reimagine it and reflect on what I've been doing. Um, but I think the challenge is that this accountability ends up feeling like compliance a lot of the times. And, and I feel like I am complying with the, the needs and wants because what is the new hot button trend of this next cycle of teaching? Because there's always one. There's always one. I'm trying to think. Right now it's literacy in the classroom. I've been teaching literacy because every teacher teaches literacy. But they're getting it to the point where they don't know their pedagogical intentionality for why they're doing it. They just think if they see the results, then obviously they were the reasons why it happened and it has nothing to do with the teachers because we're giving them 110% all the time and that's really the challenge with the accountability and that's, that's the frustration on top of it. Okay. Um, so I think number one, you bring up a really good point, Ash, because um, uh, when, I, when I looked at a lot of what we've learned about teacher turnover isn't particularly new, the accountability pressures that are that are in this data, I think, is is showing uh, that just as many of us have suspected, particularly those who represented teachers for so long, that the accountability pressures are having a significant impact on teachers' willingness to stay in the classroom. Uh, from I'll be honest, from a, at, a, at a local level, uh, our teachers uh, haven't seen or heard any real change. When it comes to ESSA, right, it's still, I think that uh, our teachers, like a whole lot of teachers, probably have a skeptical wait and see. Yeah, right. We'll believe that it's going to be less pressure when we see it. Uh, and so you know, Maryland, like a whole lot of other places, are right in the middle of we just put our plan in. And, um, uh, and I, I will say that over the last couple of years, uh, we've gone through a rather, rather significant process of test reduction. Uh, a, a lot because of what we've heard from teachers and parents that said this test thing is getting out of control. Um, uh, and we've, uh, I forget the number, I think we're, we're at about 15 or 16 percent less time in testing this year than we were last year. Um, uh, and so hopefully that will begin to address it. Uh, but I think really the jury is out on, on the impact that ESSA might have on teachers. I'm Saroja Warner with the Council of Chief State School Officers, but I'm asking this question as an advocate for children and communities right now. Um, Sagoon, I want to come back to a comment you made earlier because it really spoke to my spirit when you called out that this work can't be done pro bono and for free. It will require an investment of resources. And so I'm really curious to hear, I think particularly from you, Sagoon, and we're you sit in your experiences working in Prince George's County about how this question of stakeholder engagement, I mean, this is bigger than this. This is about being able to see where people's priorities are by where they invest their resources. This for me is a civil rights issue at its core. I look at this data, thank you, right? <laughs> I look at this data and these are the, the students who are living on the margins and their families who are most impacted by what is happening with teacher turnover. So how else do we make this argument that there is no greater public good right now that we need to be investing in than in solving this problem? Saroj, you, you can answer the question too if you want. <laughs> feel, yeah, feel free, sister. I mean, <laughs> um, I, look, I'll just say briefly, you know, I've been on, on the board for four years and had a long 30-year career uh, in education before that, and this is no joke when it comes to how we look at issues of, of investment. We tried in Prince George's County to get bold uh, and put a huge tax increase reform in that was going to dramatically be able to, to, to increase compensation for teachers and, and put in and it crashed and burned quicker than anyone can imagine and we're still uh, recovering uh, from that. At the same time, we're, you know, it, it's, it's always a very heated debate. We, you know, we, we, do, we still have a, we have a $1.9 billion budget. Uh, so uh, our teachers are telling us right now, use what, what, use what you got to give us what we need. Uh, and it's a reasonable argument and we're kind of, kind of, it's always a, a kind of back and forth about how you, um, uh, about how you can make, uh, make these tough choices. 
Uh, I will just say, you know, our, our data shows that while we're, you know, we think that given our circumstances, we'll do pretty good at teacher turnover. We're still at about double what our surrounding counties are, uh, with the exception of DC. Uh, the Maryland counties that surround us are four, five, six percent turnover each year. Um, and they're at you know, about 15 to $20,000 per <coughs> student higher than they are, than we are in spending. Everyone wants to think that that's some kind of a weird coincidence. It's hard <laughs> to imagine that by the time it's said and done, how you don't begin uh, to make those investments. But part of it is about uh, how kind of faith that, that communities and voters particularly need to have in school districts in order to demand it. Uh, because until they do, uh, uh, until they demand it, the policymakers are not are not going to touch investing in education with 10-foot poles. And Nyland and Tony, can you pick up on that kind of in the work that you're that you're doing? Do you see it being communicated as a civil rights issue? Is that how it's being talked about, um, particularly Nyland, in your work? Yeah, I mean, that was the whole foundation of why the residency exists the way it does. It's, it's really to become agents of change and to create these voices for the students. And that's why we are about fostering democracy in the classroom because we, we got to make sure that they are the voices that get to be heard um, as the key stakeholders and recipients of education because if it's not for them then for whom else mm -hmm. so I, I just to briefly address it yeah absolutely um, I definitely think it is a uh, civil rights issue um, it's pretty clear that uh, many of our teachers uh, are really struggling because the lack of you know the perception that it's just really lacking support for our teachers. People have a really poor perception of teachers. So um, definitely, uh, how, how are we going to fix this is to shift our perceptions that we have of staff and teachers. Um, specifically to more like a more supportive perception. Um, I know uh, in, in Singapore, their teachers, they're called nation builders. And because they're, they're, they're moving their knowledge, they're giving their knowledge about their nation to, to the next generation. And I feel like we should really have that perception on teachers in our districts. Good morning. Um, before I ask my question, I would like to preface by saying that I just graduated from high school so, and I actually attended a, a Title I school in Colorado, one of the lowest performing academic um, environments in the state of Colorado, predominantly Hispanic. and um, in my experience, I had six different principals over the course of four years. So the turnover was actually um, more experienced at the administrative level. Um, and it felt, um, I know that you guys talked a lot about the residency programs for teachers and how to support our teachers, but I feel as though um, this is really kind of like an inverted pyramid. Um, our uh, legislators at the state are in, 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 I feel as though they're not in touch with our nation or like our leaders uh, at the national level and our state uh, leaders aren't in touch with our school boards. Our school boards aren't in touch with our teachers. Our teachers aren't in touch with our community and our parents, which leads to the students. Therefore, it is a, a chain reaction. And I feel as though um, I just, I would like to know um, in your experience as an educator, as a student and as a uh, member of school board, what we can do to prepare our administration. Um, I had a lot of administrative members who never stepped foot in a classroom. Um, policy was being made um, in a way that I think um, it said, yeah, let's have community forums, let's talk about this. And we did put our input, but it was never actually implemented. And so a lot of these things look great on paper, um, but they're not actually being enforced. Um, and um, yeah, so I was just wondering um, <laughs> that <laughs> because um, I, um, I'm very, very passionate about it, and I just feel as though a lot of administrators, a lot of teachers, and a lot of policy members um, basically just use these Title I schools as a stepping stone for their career, and not really because they're invested in the civil rights aspect and in the actual community. So, question? And I have to follow right. that. <laughs> Right, so we do have time for Rob's question, but maybe we can talk just around kind of maybe some, the administrative support around what some efforts maybe you're doing around keeping administrators uh, in the district as well. 
Sure. I mean, it's just, if, if, if we did the same study on administrators, I think we'd find, uh, we'd find some, some similar work in, uh, in Prince George's County. We have, we, we've worked with the Wallace Foundation for the past five years on uh, effort to, uh, to support principals. Um, I think it's interesting when we've done uh, um, a lot and actually been nationally recognized for the kind of leadership development work we've done. Uh, we still have work to do when you look at some of our feedback from our, our survey. Numbers of teachers who don't feel supported by their principal is, is remarkably high, but how we support and, and sustain uh, our, our leaders is, uh, is equally uh, as important to this effort. Uh, and, and, I, and I, I would just say the way we deal with teachers and administrators traditionally in public schools is we don't, we don't pay you for your hard work so the, our reward structure is that you move to easier jobs. That is still the primary structure. And so, of course, you started a Title I school as a teacher, and you cut your teeth as a new teacher in a Title I school. Uh, and when you've gotten some experience and some seniority under your belt, you move to an easier school, and principals are doing the same thing. So until we can flip that reward structure and start to reward uh, our, our most capable folks for taking on the most challenging assignments, that whole process of, 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 of principal and teacher movement between schools uh, won't be solved. So we have time just for one more question. And I'll make it quick. That was an excellent question, by the way. Um, thank you, Jessica, panelists, Linda, and your team. Um, my name's Rob Mahaffey. I'm the executive director of the Rural School and Community Trust. We advocate on behalf of the 12 million children that live in rural and remote places. And I'm really struck in the research, so Desiree, I turn to you, that the states, the two states that have the highest turnover rate are Arizona and New Mexico. And the, state, the two states that have the lowest turnover rate are my home state of West Virginia and Utah. Those are four very rural states. You get outside of Charleston and Salt Lake City, Phoenix, what are you seeing in the data that makes a difference in rural communities? Because we know that rural teachers tend to be their, their lifers. They come, they start, they stay, they never leave. And, and that has its advantages and its challenges, right? Or teachers are on a constant churn. There isn't sort of this core set of teachers like Antonio that have been there six, seven, eight years. So are you finding anything? Because this is a key issue for us at the Rural School and Community Trust. Um, pretty consistently that um, schools in cities have higher turnover rates no matter what region you're looking at. Um, but that rural schools were sort of um, different from cities in that in some places in the West in particular, rural schools had especially high turnover rates, higher than, um, uh, I mix up my, my stats, but I wanna say it was higher than cities in, in Western states um, versus in the South, the Midwest, the Northeast, um, rural schools had some of the lowest turnover rates. So um, it is an interesting question. It's not one that we uh, investigated deeply, but um, it, you know, I think it's, it's one that we will want to dig into a bit more. Um, you know, it's hard looking specifically at, you know, specific state data using the, the source that we were looking at. Um, but regionally, um, that is, that is uh, something that we noticed. I wish I could tell you, give you some, some reasons why that might be, um, but it's not something that we looked into. I'd like to thank our first panel for setting the stage on what this looks like in practice, and we will now turn over to our policy panel, who can talk more about the solution side, um, although that can help support actually the solutions that you're implementing at the local level. So thank you all very much.